Okay, we'll continue on with the program. Uh, next talk uh, is we're back to the shorter talk format. Prospective comparison of posterior fossa exploration and radiosurgery as primary surgery for patients with typical trigeminal neuralgia presented by Dr. Pollock. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers of the section for allowing me to present this paper and to thank Kim Shorbo, a nurse within our group, who contacted patients to get the last outcomes and maximize our follow-up. Trigeminal neuralgia is well known to neurosurgeons. Uh, there's an epidemiology report from the UK in 2006 that describes an incidence of 27,000, excuse me, 27 patients per 100,000 people, with it, with it being more common in women and more common as we age. If we use various databases, we can estimate that there's about 8,000 surgeries per year performed within the United States for trigeminal neuralgia, and that the direct cost of these surgeries exceeds $100 million annually within the U.S. The most common cause of trigeminal neuralgia is a neurovascular compression of the nerve, most typically by the superior cerebellar artery. When we discuss the various surgeries, essentially they can be divided into two groups. One is non-destructive, where you go after the cause of the problem, a microvascular decompression, initially described by Dandy and popularized by Dr. Janetta. Ultimately, the goal of the surgery is to take away that neurovascular compression in some manner to provide some cushion or some space between the vessel and this nerve. Uh, the benefits of this surgery is that for the vast majority of patients, they wake up from surgery and their pain is gone. Uh, it's durable, uh, and ultimately, it does not require trigeminal nerve injury to have a good result. When we look at destructive procedures, there's a large number of surgeries that can be performed. Um, essentially, the goal at the, at the level of the, the root or ganglion is some degree of nerve injury. And again, radiosurgery, glycerizotomy, balloon compression, ultimately leading up to a nerve section. But ultimately and historically looking at the success of these surgeries, this, they pretty much go hand in hand with the degree of injury to the dry geminal system. This is a paper that re sort of re uh, resurrected radiosurgery as a methodology to treat this. Uh, Doug Konziolka put together a prospective dose escalation trial published in 1996 using more modern imaging uh, and using a, a target of the proximal root and a single four millimeter isocenter of radiation. There were 50 patients enrolled. Uh, the majority had failed previous surgeries. Ultimately, they found that the time to pain relief was about a month and that ultimately uh, about one half of patients became pain-free either on or off medications, and there, there appeared to be better results as dose increased above 70 gray. Since that time, there's been a large number of papers published on trigeminal neuralgia radiosurgery, and there's a general correlation between dose and nerve injury and ultimately pain relief, again, going along with the idea that this is a destructive procedure. There's a recent paper published, a, a joint paper by Brussels and Marseille, where they re reviewed the dose symmetry of 358 patients. And the impetus for doing this was using a similar methodology, which is a distal nerve target, and using higher doses than typically described in the U.S. They were finding res uh, results in terms of numbness being vastly different. They basically segmented the nerves themselves and calculated the mean doses to the nerves and ultimately saw that as you increase the mean dose to the trigeminal nerve, you increase success, but you concurrently increase the amount of numbness that these patient cohorts had. Certainly, radiosurgery is increasing in popularity, and it may very well be the most common surgery performed in the U.S. at this point for this problem. I, I really don't know. Uh, data compiled by the Lexell Society up to uh, December of 06, which is not just uh, primary surgeries, uh, but with 202 centers reporting, we see that almost 20, over 25,000 patients had undergone trigeminal neuralgia radiosurgery. So what I hoped to do uh, was compare my own results looking at posterior fossa exploration and, and gamma knife. I trained at the University of Pittsburgh in trigeminal neuralgia, uh, sort of the trigeminal neuralgia mecca of the world in some ways. Um, in about the, the spring or summer of 1999, I decided this was something I was going to pursue more throughout my career. So we started a prospective study, essentially where on a, on a, on a regular basis, we entered all their data, basically tracked their outcomes at a month, 
and then tried to get yearly outcomes for these patients as time went by, recorded their failures, et cetera, et cetera. With regard to my posterior fossa experience, to be honest, I didn't do any surgeries in the posterior fossa for this from the time I left Pittsburgh until about this time. I just didn't think that was my job at the Mayo Clinic. But over time, I came to realize that perhaps I could do this as well or better than my partner. So about this time, I started to do this surgery. There were a lot of changes in trigeminal neuralgia radio surgery, however. We, we went up in dose. We had changed the target. We had a trial at Pittsburgh where we had one shot versus two shots. But starting in about the June of 2001, we had settled into using a single isocenter between 80 to 87 gray, depending on the correction factor, the four millimeter isocenter, to treat patients with idiopathic tick. And so it's over that time frame up until the fall of 07 that we studied. So in that time frame, we did about 500 surgeries for patients with idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia and basically identified 149 as having a first surgery for virtual type 1 trigeminal neuralgia. Ultimately, we had nine patients with less than six months of follow-up, and they were excluded. And as you can see, I had a bias in a sense. We, we primarily tell patients we believe their outcomes will be better if we do a posterior fossa surgery. Nonetheless, patient preference still overrides us in many cases. So when we looked at these groups, certainly the gamma-knife patients were slightly older. Uh, but with regard to gender, pain duration, pain location, and follow-up, really no difference between the two groups. At the time of our surgery, we did an MBD for 92% and a partial nerve section in eight. Essentially, the overlap between finding veins alone to nerve section was pretty high in my early experience. We, we don't cut nerves this frequently as I, as I progress along in my experience. Average length of stay was three days. Gamma knife radius surgery, as I said, a single four millimeter isocenter, a median dose of 85 gray, and all patients were performed, all, all for the procedures were done as an outpatient. Our follow-up, uh, 30 patients required later surgery, two people died, and 180, 108 we got uh, last contact. So a median follow-up of 38 months. And for me, my, myself, I, I do understand and sympathetic to the description of pain relief and success in this problem. Nonetheless, for statistical purposes, I think it's very clear to know two endpoints with everything else being hard to know. And that is, if you have someone who, who has no pain and take no meds, we understand that. We also understand those that patients that go on to have more surgery. I think everything between those two are susceptible to manipulation to some degree, and we try to exclude them whenever possible as far as our outcome studies. And this is what I got. Essentially, here we, at three years, we see that a little more than 80% of the patients undergoing a posterior fossa exploration were pain-free off medications compared to 60% having gamma knife. If we look at additional surgery, we performed it 15% of the time for patients having posterior fossa exploration and a little more than one-third for patients undergoing gamma knife. It did, come, but it did come at a cost. This is a bigger surgery. We had three patients that had a CSF leak requiring an oversewing of their wound. Two patients lost their hearing of a wound infection and pneumonia in a DVT. In describing facial numbness, and again, this is a patient's description of any sensory alteration for both of these groups, ultimately found that one in five of the patients undergoing a posterior fossa surgery described some numbness and that 3% described a dysesthetic pain, all those had undergone a nerve section. But when we just performed a microvascular decompression, still at a 14% incidence of a patient subjective, uh, patient subjectively saying a change in their facial sensation. With gamma knife, we basically had the only complication, whether or not it's a complication or not, it's hard to know, uh, probably not, but 33% described some sensory change with 8% describing some form of a dysesthetic pain requiring ongoing medication. For posterior fossa exploration, there was no correlation between developing numbness and having a good outcome, where there was a clear correlation with gamma knife that if you develop some degree of facial uh, numbness or sensory loss, that you would do much better. So in short, my conclusion was, at least in my hands, poster fossa exploration is a more effective operation as a primary surgical option for patients with typical trigeminal neuralgia. Thank you very much. This paper will now be discussed by Dr. Ken Follett. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, provide a few comments regarding Dr. Pollock's study. 
He described a prospective series of individuals who underwent either posterior fossa exploration, which was predominantly microvascular decompression, or gamma knife radiosurgery for treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. There are a number of strengths to his study. This represents the experience of a single surgeon at a single center, which eliminates the variability that can be introduced with multi-center, multi-surgeon studies, which can include such issues as variations in patient selection criteria, surgeons' varying preferences for surgical technique, as well as which procedure to offer to individuals. This was a very relatively large population of patients. The few reports in the literature typically describe at best a few dozens of patients, so this is really one of the largest series that's been reported that compares these two approaches to management of trigeminal neuralgia. And the groups in the two arms were relatively well matched, with the exception of age, which Dr. Pollack mentioned. The radiosurgery patients were about nine years older on average. Certainly we don't know what effect this might have in terms of influencing the outcomes. And the follow-up was relatively long. We've seen that in general the results tend to stabilize after a few years, so that the length of follow-up becomes important. And I think it's credible that he eliminated those individuals who had less than six months follow-up. The median follow-up of 38 months, I think, is better than most reports published in the literature. On the other hand, there are a few weaknesses with the study. This is not a randomized study, and the difficulty with lack of randomization is that a number of biases can be introduced into the study, both on the parts of the physicians as well as the patients. In general, patients will opt for whatever procedure the surgeon recommends, and oftentimes it can be very, the physicians can have very subtle ways of influencing patient decisions. For example, the way we couch description of a procedure can sway the patient toward or away from that surgery. Also, patients increasingly come to see us with thoughts regarding what procedure they want. They've been on the Internet. They've talked to other individuals who've had one surgery or another, and oftentimes they've made up their minds what procedure they want before they arrive in our offices. These are the types of biases that can certainly affect the outcomes. It's important to keep in mind that the posterior fossa exploration group included a number of patients who had partial nerve section. They represented about 8% of the individuals in that arm. It's unclear what impact that has on the outcomes. Certainly we would expect that those individuals would tend to do fairly well. Finally, the follow-up was conducted by phone. That raises the possibility of inaccurate reporting by the patients. It's unlikely that patients would describe their degree of pain relief inaccurately, with the possible exception of an individual who is largely pain-free, may have rare flare-ups, and depending on the time of the follow-up call, if it's just before a flare-up, the patient will say he's pain-free. If it happens to come shortly after a flare-up, that will stick in his memory and will influence his response to the call. Certainly in assessing any trigeminal dysfunction, especially sensory disturbance, patients may be relatively unreliable in gauging the presence or extent of numbness. Despite the shortcomings, the overall strengths of this being a single series, I'm sorry, a single center, single surgeon, large series of patients, really provides us a reasonable characterization of outcomes of posterior fossa exploration and gamma knife radiosurgery for tick pain. The outcomes are similar to what's been reported in the literature previously, which shows that in general microvascular decompression has a higher likelihood of providing pain relief and provides a more durable response than radiosurgery. Should we take these data as an indictment against radiosurgery for treating tick pain? Well, I don't think so. It's important to keep in mind that we need to individualize treatment. We need to take into account such factors as patient demographic characteristics, age, comorbidities, 
uh, complication rates, which in Dr. Pollock's series were about 8%. We need to consider patient preferences. They may not want an invasive procedure. They may not be able to devote time to post-op recovery. And we need to think about their anticipated tolerance of sensory deficit following a procedure. So I would suggest that rather than considering radiosurgery as inferior to posterior fossa exploration, which is the glass uh, half empty, uh, we ought to look at radiosurgery as the glass 53% full. It represents a relatively non-invasive uh, treatment that, that has at least a 50% likelihood of providing good pain relief. Thank you. Doug, do you have any comments on, on that conclusion? Well, thanks, Phil. It's, it's good to see that the stereotactic section still has discussion as, as part of it. The other rooms are just people quiet between talks, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. Well, I think, you know, Bruce talked about that key issue of what do we really know? You know, we know, we know pain-free off drugs. We know what that means. We know you needed another operation. You know, we know what that means. I think it's that middle ground that we've kind of ignored you know, in, in this presentation, the patient who's a lot better, but maybe is not perfect. Remember, they've had, to, they've had it for eight years, and so being a lot better can be a really good thing. Some of these people do not come off medicine. After eight years of Tegretol, Tegretol is a vitamin in their life. And when it, redu when it gets down to one pill a day, it's, you know, I'm taking my multivitamin, my Centrum Silver, my Tegretol, and that's just part of my life. So I think we need really quality of life, activities of daily living assessments, in this disease because this is such a terrible pain problem and affects people in so many different ways. It's not just about those two endpoints. Thank you very much.